In this video, we shall present a definition of proof. But before we go there, we will look into our experience with constructing proof. And then from there, we can distill the essence of a mathematical proof. So the word proof can appear in different contexts. We have a context, of course, for math and law. So you're familiar with the mathematical proof. You did this in high school. But there is the context of law. A proof is somewhat like an evidence. If you are accusing your neighbor of having stolen your bicycle and you will report that to the police, the police will demand an evidence. That is the proof. And the evidence can be the video that you got from a CCTV camera. There is another context for the word proof and you may have seen this. Bullet proof, type on proof, AT proof. So a bullet proof is something that cannot be destroyed by a bullet. Typhoon proof, so these are like houses and infrastructures. These are, or these are infrastructures that cannot be destroyed by a typhoon. But we have another context for the word proof, and you see this in chemistry. AT proof. Maybe you have seen the Battle of uh, Ginebra San Miguel that your father is drinking occasionally. And you will see it there. It's printed in the label 80 proof. So the 80 proof there has something to do with the proportion of pure alcohol to the volume of the, of the alcoholic solution. So this one is from chemistry. I opened Cambridge and Merriam-Webster dictionaries. And uh, these are the definitions of proof that I saw. It is a convincing or persuasive demonstration. If the security guard accosted you, because you were entering the premises of the university, he would say, hey, who are you? You cannot enter. But then you would say, hey, I am a student of this school. And then the guard will demand a proof. Show me the proof, the guard says, and you will show your ID, your school ID. So that is your demonstration that you are a student of that school. In law, a proof is an evidence. It is a systematic presentation of, of the falsity or truth of an allegation. I opened Miriam Dictionary, Miriam Webster Dictionary, and this is what I saw. It is a fact or a piece of information that shows that something exists or is true. So this one is closer to what we are doing in math. Because in math, we always prove something like this. Something exists. Or, there is something like this. Or, this is true. We always do that in mathematics. Let us go back to your junior high school experience with geometry. Because in junior high school, that is where you did a lot of proving. So your teacher may have, may have shown you this theorem, theorem A, tangent to a circle theorem. A line AB is tangent to circle C, or circle with center C at D, if and only if AD is perpendicular to AB. So the illustration for that theorem is this. If you have a circle with center C, this line AB is tangent to C at point D, if and only if this line and that line, which is the radius of your circle, are perpendicular to each other, or, or if they form a right angle. And so you were challenged by your teacher to produce a proof. And you accepted the challenge. And so this is how you began. And, and so this is what you did. You began the proof with the word proof. You produced two columns. You organized your proof in a two-column format. So the first column contains the statements, your assertions. And the second column contains your reason to support the statements you made in the first column. So if you were not to look at this, this one, this whole thing constitute a proof. But you cannot just disarrange these statements and say that is a proof. No, there is, there is a certain order or organization to a proof. There is a certain correct uh, sequencing or listing of the statements so that the, so that the collection of statements produces a correct proof. This proof also contains something. It contains a set of assumptions. So what are those assumptions? 
Well, look at this. This is theorem 8, which means before you get to theorem 8, theorems 1 to 7 were presented to you. And we are assuming now that you and your teachers agree with those 8 or 7 earlier theorems. So those 8 or those 7 would be among the assumptions or propositions which you assume to be true. Those would be theorems from 1 to 7. But there are also other uh, assumptions here. That would be, of course, the foundation of geometry, which is, or which are the postulates of Euclidean geometry. You have, you have five of those postulates. You also have, among the assumptions, your theorems about line. Because before you can get to the circle, in, if you were to look back at the organization of geometry, before you can get to the circle, you spent a lot of time talking about lines. So, so a proof behind the proof, the unseen hand in the proof has something to do with the set of assumptions that you and your audience assume to be true. But there is also another set. It's the set of laws that we apply to logic. And that is what we call logical reasoning. So what would be an example of a law in logic? Well, look at this. A statement cannot be true and false at the same time. Another one, the law of syllogism. So this is a law of logic. For example, all humans are mortal. Plato is a human. Therefore, Plato is mortal. Uh, is there reason for you to say that that is not true? So that is part, or that would be an example of a law of logic. We call that the law of syllogism. We also have this, uh, laws of logical reasoning, okay? Transitivity. If A is equal to B, B is equal to C, then, then A is equal to C. So we listed these laws in math as actions. They are assumed to be true and they do not need a demonstration of a proof. So these are the things that are contained in a proof. Some of them are visibly there in the proof. Okay, so having gone through that dissection of our experience with proof, let us produce a definition. It is a collection of statements to establish that a proposition is true. These statements are composed and ordered according to a set of assumptions and rules of logical reasoning.